Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Building Your Iconic Life. We're here with Carson Porter, and I want you to stay tuned. This one's going to be hot, y'all. I came from the mud, there's dirt on my hands. Welcome to Build an Iconic Life podcast. I'm your host, Chris Whitehead, and this podcast is dedicated to help you build a life with zero regrets by focusing on how you have everything you need to stand up, stand out, and live life on your terms. Let's dive right in. Hey, Carson. Thanks for showing up today, man. Yeah, man. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. So before we start, one of the things that I like to do, especially with people that I know, um, because I know the flavor of the answer, (laughs) who is Carson Porter? Oh, shit, man. I know, right? Uh, right? That's the question of the century, at least for me, right? (laughs) Um, I feel like I've I've spent my whole life and I'll probably spend the rest of my life figuring that out. But um, who is Carson Porter? Man, that's not a question I get very often. At the end of the day, Carson Porter is uh, just your friendly neighborhood dude that um, I want to do and have and be and achieve at a level that I was not raised in. And I want to do that. Because I have an example to set for my boys, right? And if all they ever do is a little bit better than me, I've got to do something pretty damn incredible so that they're a little bit better than me just shakes and makes the entire world. And that that really, everything I do, uh, everything from my core values, my focus, my businesses, my personal life, it comes back to, to that. It wasn't always that way. I used to be a little shithead running around, drunk all the time and and doing all these different things that I shouldn't have been doing, but that's really the last 10, 15 years who I've become and who I'm going to continue to try and perfect. What was the reason? And and I think you've already alluded to it, but what was the straw that broke the camel's back and you started getting real serious about what you wanted to do for the rest of your life? Um, it all really started with, um, starting to have kids. You know, I never wanted a family growing up. I was about as bad attitude, asshole teenagers as you can get. Um, and I really, really led a very destructive adolescent part of my life. Right. And even young adult part of my life. And it was, it was when I got married, I met this girl, right. And she's been phenomenal for me. And this isn't to downplay her importance and role in my life at all. But when she talked me into having kids, right? And it wasn't even the moment she got pregnant. I remember our entire first pregnancy or hers. I didn't do much. I just, you know, made the runs for ice cream when she wanted it and pickles. But she would ask me all the time while she was pregnant, you know, don't you just love him? And I kept telling her, I don't friggin' know. I haven't met the bastard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I felt. But then he was born and he was born very premature. We spent a lot of time in NICU with both my boys. Um, But the moment he was born, man, it just, it shook me. Like it, it shook me. And I spent weeks sitting there in NICU, my boy. And I had all this time to, to reflect on things. And I had made some career shifts preparing for that, trying to figure out how do I make more money and spend less time doing it. And I was kind of failing. I wasn't failing miserably at it, but I wasn't doing real well, frankly. But a lot of that is because I was trying to run this new career like I'd run the whole rest of my life, being this bad attitude asshole. That just doesn't work. If you want a different result, you've got to be a different person. And um, I had literal weeks of sitting there reflecting, thinking on who and what and how I want to be that all led to this, just catching on to a, a few different thought paths or, or tracks that have, you know, sparked a flame that's grown into the inferno that we have now. So, yeah. And so before we keep going with that, um, just so people know some of the qualifications, like what is it that you do for a living and what is it that you've built? Because coming from being a self-proclaimed asshole teenager <laughs> to a very successful businessman, which you are, uh, there was a lot of change that went that you went through. What are you doing now? Yeah, so um, I was born and raised in automotive repair, and that's where I started my first couple businesses. When I made that shift in in career uh, in careers right before my first boy was born, I actually moved into the insurance industry as a home auto life insurance agent, and from there, 
I was really attracted to the life insurance side. As you get more into that, you realize there's a lot of financial services attached. And so I actually got way down the road on on financial services and completely dropped all the home and auto and, and moved on. So that's progressed into a career now where I've got multiple businesses, all of them in the wealth management sector. Uh, we still do quite a bit with life insurance as a part of wealth management, um, but we do a lot of other things as well. So I've got my own wealth management firm. Uh, we're currently managing about a quarter billion dollars. Um, we have what's called a brokerage. Uh, think of it like an ERA or a Keller Williams for realtors where uh, you've got a realtor that's just not quite doing well enough to go handle all those contracts and contacts on their own uh, at the state level and, and even at provider levels. So we provide that and they do business through us. Uh, we've got several hundred advisors. Uh, I have a business where we mentor. I have a mentoring network for insurance agents and financial advisors. We've got almost 3,500 people in that network at this point. Um, and then we built out a, a software. Uh, it's primarily a CRM, but there's a couple other functions to it as well. Uh, book management and, and different things um, for, again, insurance agents and financial advisors. So, how, how many years from inception to where you are now did it take? Yeah, 2014 to to current. So seven, eight Ooh. years. Yeah. Hear that, everybody? Seven or eight years, not 40. No. no. See, I, I want you to talk about the speed of change that you've noticed in your own life. I've been lucky enough over the last, I don't know, three years maybe, to literally watch you make some of those changes and actually celebrate some of those wins with you privately behind the curtain. Um, of some pretty massive things you've done, dude. I mean, you're kind of downplaying it a little bit, which is fair. But um, but talk about talk about what you have learned about having a bigger dream, about going from you know being in the NICU with your son, having this idea, implementing the practice, and where it's going to now. And and did you ever throttle yourself in that process? Did you were you holding you back in any of that? At every, at every turn, I'm holding myself back. I'm actually reading a book. This is the second time I've read it. It's called The Mountain Is You. Phenomenal book. I highly recommend it. Um, and getting very introspective again as I read it. I'm like, damn it. There I am doing that thing again. Right? There I am, as, as you put it, throttling myself. Um, what I found when it comes to you know that speed of success, there's a few different components. Uh, number one, you have to want it not just want to want it. And most people just want to want it. But if you truly want it, uh, you don't just want the result. You want the work in between. Because you and I both know the only difference between where you're at and where you want to be is the work in between. And yep. you got to want that work, right? Uh, just like in, if you wanted to go put on, do a bodybuilding competition. It's not that you want to stand on that stage. Most of those dudes, you, you talk to any professional, you know, IFBB pro, you feel miserable standing on that stage. You've had weeks of preparation and, and a little bit of deprivation and, and they can't wait till it's over so they can go have a pizza and, <laughs> and all these different things. What did they want? They wanted the work that was in between the daily show up and do right. And until you get very, very clear about that, you won't actually achieve it. You'll sit there and say, man, I, I want to make more money, but then you continue to do things that don't make more money. Why? Well, there's a million different reasons we self-sabotage for, but at the end of the day, we have to change again who we are and what we're doing to have a different result. We have to progress, right? What are some of the practices that you put in place to not only give you that clarity, but to maintain it while you're doing the work? Um, I guess a couple different things. I don't let myself uh, get complacent. Everybody says complacency is awful, except for Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey loves complacency and I get his that. angle on it too, but, <laughs> um, but I don't let myself get complacent. I remember the first time in, in the insurance and finance sector, I was like, you know what? I want to figure out how to make a million dollars a year. I was talking to a dude who was my mentor at the time. This was back in like 2015, 2016. And he did primarily home and auto insurance. And he had the biggest book of business for the carrier we were attached to uh, in the nation. Uh, super awesome dude, phenomenal, one, probably one of the best salesmen I've ever met, but that was the first year he had just broken a million in revenue. And he'd been in the business almost 25 years. And it, I, while I wanted to celebrate with him, I remember sitting there thinking, 
my God, I do not want to spend two, two and a half decades. I am not okay with that. I'm not, I'm not going to be complacent with it. I've got to figure out something else. That was one of the key components to me starting to look at life insurance and financial services because the revenue model was so much more robust, right? And then it took a process of figuring out how to how to create a, a duplicatable and scalable rel- revenue model from that. But but I had to get on that track first. And to get on that track, I had to want to do the work, not just want the result. I had to want to do the work. I didn't have anyone around me to teach me about financial services. Um, in our industry, everybody's very hawkish. If you're not, if they're not making money on you, it's hard to get education. And um, all the people that were making money on me only made money on me if I sold home and auto insurance, right? And so I had to go in and my wife will vouch for me. For literal years, five, six years, I was in the office by 5 a.m. And from 5 a.m. to 9 a.m. when the doors opened, I would study. And I didn't know what to study. And so I would pick up policy contracts and I would just highlight everything I didn't know, a, a word, a phrase, a concept. And then I'd go study it for a week. Wow. Um, have to get you had to get dedicated to it but i didn't i didn't know but i wanted that work in between and every time i did some of that work chris this is the other side of it every time i did some of that work i saw my revenue increase and i celebrated that win i got to celebrate it with my wife maybe we purchased something we wanted to purchase and and that we'd been saving for maybe we were able to just put some money in savings and, and not feel like we were always up against up against the uh the wall you know uh, but whatever we did, we always found ways, little ways to to celebrate those wins. Sometimes it was grabbing a freaking Mars bar and eating it, looking out over a beautiful lake. And that's that's my celebration. But if I can't celebrate my win, what the hell is the point of having the win? Right? Yep. <laughs> Who cares? So um, you got to want to want it. And then you have to be willing to let yourself have a win and and recognize that win. So I think. um and I think the other thing that you and I both have a love, for, like I read incessantly and um, actually I was just finishing up a book and one of the key components for teaching people what you're talking about is action, trigger, action, and then reward. If you do not reward yourself, you are not Pavlovian type setting yourself up to want to go produce more. And in fact, you can become a martyr. You can start doing the work for the wrong reasons. And it's nuanced, man. So many people talk about or don't talk about, but so many people go, I just want to be successful. All I've experienced, and I know you have too, and what you want to share with this, let everybody know. But the more success that I have, the narrower the road gets. Mm-hmm. The, the, more, the easier it is for me to fall off the left or the right of that narrow path, because there are lots of opportunities. Some of those opportunities aren't to find more success. They're to let off the gas pedal. They're bad relationships. There's all sorts of things. And what I've tried to educate people on is the new whiz bang Gidget is not nearly as important as the foundation that you built it on. Yeah. And I want to hear from you as you've had higher and higher and higher levels of success, hundreds of people under your umbrella now. What is it that you're coming to now that is more foundational that you know is the driver for scaling your company to 10x what it is at the moment? It is. So I love the analogy you use that the further you go, the more narrow the road is uh, for multiple reasons, because that driver is focus. It Mm. is like, that is it. It is, it is having a well-developed core focus. And in in this mentoring network that I have, that's one of the first things that we teach these people is you got to understand who you are. That's your core values. And then you have to have a well-defined core focus. that's clear and concise. If it's a page long, you don't know what the fuck you're trying to get at, right? (laughs) But it should define what and how, what am I trying to get to? How am I going to do it in one to two sentences? That's That's it. And that focus drives you forward. So, so why do I like your analogy so much? Not only does it become easier and easier to fall off with these distractions, that core focus is it's a tangible asset. We, we call it our water cooler. We can literally frame it up and put it by the water cooler. It's not a mission statement. It's a compass. It's a, okay, here's where I'm headed with my day. 
am I headed in that path? But the cool thing about the path getting narrower and narrower along the way is that the further you go, the faster you go. Yeah. Right. If you stay on the path. Why? Because when the path is really narrow, I can meander this way and I can meander that way and I'm still on the path. Right. But we know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And the more narrow my path gets, the more straight my line is. And if I will stay on that, I can compound on my success faster and faster and faster and faster. But I have to have some well-developed tools. If I never take the time to be intentional about who I am and who I want to work with, and then the what and the how of how I'm, uh, of what I'm going to accomplish that day and how I'm going to go about it, well, then I really don't have a hope to stay on that narrow path, do I? No. And, you know, it it speaks back again to why it is so important to know who you are um, and then how you do what you do. Because my experience has been you're creating your own life in that process, meaning if you want to go far and that road gets narrow, the other distractions must go away. If you didn't include the things that are really important to you, it would be awfully shitty to figure that out once the funnel is actually speeding up and pushing you in the direction of everything that you want. So, and I've seen it happen to many, many people in lots of different ways, but this series of, of podcast is really designed for high performers. Hmm. It's designed for those people that are willing to go give it their all. And with that comes a lot of empathy for please dude, please ma'am, focus some time, energy, and attention on defining what you truly want. And the bottom line is this. I don't know about you. You shared your part of the story. I grew up not being a rebellious teenager. I grew up being rebellious when I decided to start my business because everybody in my family was white collar workers, you know, and I go, yeah, I'm going to go 13 credits shy of graduating James Madison University and quit. I'm going to get into a corporate job and say, no, thank you, and start a business in remodeling, which I had no business doing, no idea about anything, nor did I understand about business. And so my rebellion came in my 20s. And then I realized I had chosen a lifestyle. Entrepreneurism is a lifestyle. Mm. Um, there are rules to engagement. And if you don't follow them, you will pay the price. For you, what are some of the things that you would talk about to other people that are on this path from your experience to help them overcome some hurdles that you know are on their way as they're choosing to become, air quote, successful? Yeah, I would say one of the first distinctions they really need to make, and it comes from again a lot of a lot of reflection and time spent with yourself and understanding who you are and your and your focus, is does your is your focus best achieved by being an entrepreneur or is it best achieved by being an entrepreneur? And and I think too many people believe entrepreneurialism to mean that you're a business owner. Hell no, just mm -hmm. about anybody can go get a freaking LLC. It isn't that hard, right? Being a business owner is being a business owner. Being an entrepreneur is being somebody who creates value where value did not previously exist. And that's an awful lot of, of uh, creative responsibility, right? Being an entrepreneur is being somebody who sees that vision, sees that value, and then implements it on a daily basis to ensure that it comes to fruition, right? And not everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody's cut out to be an entrepreneur, but on the path to success, you have to have both. I would not be successful as an entrepreneur without the entrepreneurs that I've plugged into my, not just my business, but my life. An entrepreneur doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be a business partner or an employee. An entrepreneur could be your fitness coach. An entrepreneur could be your, your mental health coach. This is somebody who's plugging into your dream and your vision and is helping you better achieve your focus. Make sure it comes to fruition. Make sure you don't self-sabotage. Right. Because you see all this shiny shade off to the right and shiny shit off to the left and, and you want to go chase it. So that's the first thing I would say that they that people really need to do. And then the second thing they they really need to do. It sounds crunchy. It sounds granola. It sounds like you're eating one of those nature granola bars and it's just falling in your lap and, and you're doing it all day, every day. But but the reality is, is you got to get to know yourself and you've got to want to change yourself, because if you're just getting into this path of. 
I want to become, become successful as an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. It doesn't matter. You have to change who you are. You cannot continue to be who you are, having done the things you've done and expect to end up in a different place. You have to be different. And becoming different is one of the hardest, most treacherous journeys you'll mm-hmm. ever take. But it is so rewarding. Dude, I texted you. I was, I think it was back in like January or February. I remember. We had just gotten together for a couple of days to do some networking and, and learning and growing together. And and this this process of of becoming who you want to be, it never ends, right? It's it's always there. And man, I was just having a breakdown. I'm in the middle of a sitting in first class on an American airline flight, and everybody's sitting around me in the air air hostess is like are you okay? I'm just like in tears, dude. And I, I remember shooting you a message. You had said a few things that just struck me, but I'm not ashamed of that. Right. And, and it isn't like, Oh, well, it's okay for men to cry. No, like you need to be comfortable getting really uncomfortable with yourself and the shit that you're up to, because if it's not going to accomplish your end result, you need to stop being up to that thing. You've got to find a different reward. And, um, and that's, it's a hard and treacherous journey, but you've got to make a decision that you want to walk it. So my, my experience, I appreciate you sharing that. My experience is whether you believe in God and you call it higher power, you can call it the universe, you can call it a fairy rainbow fart for all I care. Um, but if you don't believe that the universe or that God will aid you when you are true to who you are, you haven't yet been true to yourself. That's what I know. And once I understood that there was magic behind the curtain of Oz, my particular bent was I wanted to understand. I'm, I'm all about foundation, bro. I'm a remodeler. So it's like, yeah, we're going to dig around until we see what this thing is put on a bed of granite. But you're absolutely right. In the process of finding out who you are, you find out who you really are. You find out what excuses you make for yourself. You find out your tendency to want to do that. And more importantly, you find the hero that's within that says, I won't stand for how I'm being anymore. And therefore I'm willing to do whatever it did. Bro, you've spoken about this, threaded it through this entire conversation, falling in love with the process, not the result. And if I could wake up young America, especially and say, stop trying to be the crypto millionaire. Not that you shouldn't do that, but why don't we get focused on making a beautiful painting? Why don't we get focused on what art do you have in you, even if it's words? I don't care. Even if it's digging a damn good ditch. My papa, my grandfather used to say, if you're going to hoe a row, hoe a good row. It doesn't matter who you are. And the fact that you were vulnerable enough to reach out, dude, those are some of those things in my core values that that's the reason you're on this podcast. I have the right to say yes or no to anybody that shows up, but it's especially in today's world, men that are able to go, dude, it that doesn't diminish me. It actually enhances me to know that more of us guys, and we're alpha dudes, like, bro, say something about my wife and I will punch you in the forehead, like no fucks given. (laughs) <laughs> like literal, but it's the fact that I can also hold space for another man who's going through some shit too, bro. What do you think I've needed all my life? The kind of men that I had around me, they were like, cry one more time and I'll give you a reason to, yeah. that's what I was raised in, but I've also seen the fallout from that. And well, for you, to, for you to create this kind of network especially in the industry that you're in, which is devoid of that kind of vulnerability. You spoke to not only entrepreneur and entrepreneur, you also spoke to visionary and integrator. And I'm just going to tell everybody, Mr. Porter is leaving clues because success always does. You should listen to some of the words on this. And if they don't make sense to you, you should take a page out of his own book, highlight them and go study what that means. It might lighten your life to the point that success becomes something different than you even thought that it was. Carson, who is your network open to? Um, Depends on on which level, but uh, on the wealth management level, my network's open to accredited investors. On a personal level, 
my network is open to people who are dedicated to improving themselves in the world around them. That's sounds fluffy and like I'm, I'm shooting for the Miss America pageant and I might be, but, uh, but it's just the honest to God truth. If it comes to our mentoring network for insurance agents, financial advisors, we help. Uh, like I say, I haven't had anybody come into the community yet that we haven't been able to help. Um, our retention rate is, is through the roof. Um, and it, I believe it's because we're, we're actually helping people, but who I built it around is it's the, the background I came from multi-line insurance agents, home and auto health insurance, Medicare supplements, those kind of agents who want to increase their life insurance sales, who want to increase their financial services, who want to get into wealth management and break through that door because it's, it's hard and you shouldn't have to spend 20 years to make a million dollars. It should take you three to five if you do it right. And, um, and so that's primarily again, who, who we're pointed at. If so quick, quick pitch, if they want to find out more information about that particular network, where would you send them? Yeah. Either hit me up on Facebook or Instagram at C Porter three, eight, nine. Um, or you can, uh, just jump on our website, rev agency syndicate.com. Okay. What do you have upcoming that's new and exciting in the next uh, six to 12 months, brother? Oh, dude, so, so much. <laughs> yeah, that slide. Did you, you hear know, that, everybody? <laughs> it's, sometimes it's a little overwhelming thinking about it, but no, we, we've got a bunch. We've got that day I sent you that text. Um, the very next day, call the gal up and I paid her thousands of dollars to help coach me through writing a book. We've got that book launch coming up here soon. And I've got another book I've been in the process of. So the first book is, it's a lot more my story, my path, me getting over my own ego investment so that I could learn the things I didn't know from people who'd been there. Right. Do you have a title um, for that one yet? So what now, what? So what now, what everybody, you heard it here first, keep going. So, so that'll be a, a great one. The second book, it's, it's a lot shorter read, a um, lot more industry specific and it's all about building the master agency in three to five years. What are the four key steps? What things, what, what pitfalls are going to be along the way and how do you overcome and avoid those? Um, so we should be launching that one. We might actually even launch that one first. So we'll see, but, um, got that going. Um, got a whole bunch of other things, just struck down some really big deals for our brokerage, uh, which I'm super excited about. We're going to start plugging all of our advisors into three to five appointments per day without them having to go and prospect. Um, the Holy whole idea, yeah, it's, we, we've, we've been striking some big deals and the whole idea being, look, you know, in this business, you don't, you don't get paid to look for people. You don't get paid to even service people, frankly. So for those of you that think your advisor is paid to provide service, that's not true. Your advisor is paid to to help you purchase items. They don't sell you shit. They help you to purchase. There's a clear distinction there. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but that's all they get paid to do. And at some point they're able to make enough revenue to hire the staff, to provide the service and the, because they want you to keep coming back. And that's where we want to get them to. But 92% of this business fails out in the first 12 to 24 months. Cause they can't even get revenue positive enough to do that. Um, and so what we want to do is get them over that revenue positive hump. Let's get them to a quarter million in revenue quicker so they can pay somebody 50,000 bucks a year to take phenomenal care of those clients that they're bringing in. Um, so it's, I don't know, exciting, big projects that, uh, that we're working on, but I'm excited for it. So dude, you know, um, you're taking me back and shout out to a gentleman named Nate Dempsey. He was my first client ever in 2012 he's in your profession and he was the number one, uh, not only in his office, but, and this is a big, big company, but he was number one in the top three in the entire corporation. He had hired me for the mindset of how to start talking to high net worth clients. And I helped him and he made a lot more revenue, but dude, what you're offering was what he actually needed. He had just broken into having like a five person, maybe three to five person staff. He was starting to offer the service. He was doing it all under the umbrella of another company. And the reason he started uh, working with me instead of inside the industry is his opinion was when they would go to these big events with, you know, 3000 people, it was all a huge money grab mm -hmm. and you had to spend 
thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars to even have the opportunity to learn something. And I can understand why a young 30 something guy would be like, eh, you know, I'm, I'm happy making half a million dollars a year, but I don't really want to give it all away. What you're offering is a godsend to the right people. They have to have the right core values. And so what I want to end this uh, conversation on, Carson, if you're willing to share, what are the values that are important for you, for the people that are coming in that might want to learn more about you? As far as our values go, honest. And and I'm very... So one of the things that I teach when we talk about putting core values together, it's not just defining a value. We need to know what the hell we mean by that value. And we need everyone else to know too. So when I say honest, I don't just mean I'm honest with you and I'm honest with myself. I also mean that not only am I, but you are able, willing, and driven to make and keep commitments because I don't believe you can be honest through omission. You are always honest through commission, right? Um, So we really dive into these very hard and deep, but got to be honest, got to be authentic, got to be utterly dependable, got to have a positive attitude and have to be invested and whole self-centric. Those are our, our values. It's a little more than a lot of people want to uh, want to have. They say three or four values, but man, there was just too many things that, that were left on the table unless I define those others. So I think it's beautiful, especially when you're talking about like, you know, I money is a whole different conversation, but it's certainly something that people invest the majority of their life doing to have, doing something to have. I think it's pretty damn important for every one of those core values you just listed to make sure that the people that you're bringing in, if they're not there yet, they're striving to be there from the examples that leadership gives them. Bro, I appreciate you. We're going to put your links on this uh, face of this page when we send it out. But if people want to reach out to you directly, what is the best way for them to reach out to you again? Yeah, again, best way to reach out to me is is just through Facebook Messenger um, or Instagram uh, Messenger at C Porter 389. That's the best way to get me. You can shoot me an email, Carson P at RevAgencySyndicate.com. But I'm going to be honest, I get hundreds of emails a day and there's a good chance it either gets lost or filtered by my staff. So um, yep. just, just hit me up on social media. I all I answer all my own stuff still uh, as far as messages go. So feel free to hit me up. Bro, as soon as you are ready to drop that book, you let us know because we're going to promote it loud and proud out on the social media. I'm really excited for you and I really appreciate you taking time to come on and share with our audience today. I appreciate you having me and let me let me shout the good word from the, the rooftops. Yeah, man. Well, we'll talk to you soon. We look forward for your book. Sounds good, brother. Take care, everybody. Hey friend, if you enjoyed listening to this podcast, please leave a review and subscribe to catch future casts. If you really enjoyed this episode, make sure you share it so others can benefit from it as well. I'll see you in the trenches.